In the cinematic sea of prequels, sequels, reboots, and reimaginings, the Movie Retakes podcast considers the merits and desires for Hollywood's new takes on our beloved movie classics. Brothers Matt and Chris Sully, and a special guest, examine the latest retake franchises, pitch their own original retake visions, and share their love for the movies that made them. This is Big Sully. And this is Matt. Please don't cut off my head, Sully. Uh, and there could be only one movie retakes podcast, but there could be multiple hosts. Today we have another host with us, our old friend, a dear friend, Corey Thompson. Welcome, Corey. This is Corey, not a Sully Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> Today you are. Not by name, but honorarily. Absolutely. Thanks, brothers. Hey, everybody <laughs> on the podcast is an honorary Sully. Well, welcome, Corey. Uh, we were just talking about it. Corey and I have known each other for three decades. We we met as little tykes, and now we're big, burly young men. <laughs> Very burly. <laughs> yeah, everybody's rocking a beard here. It's and almost we like good. we're all adults after all these years. Uh, almost. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to have Corey on. We have all known each other for quite a while. You two got to be friends in high school, or wait, no, junior high, right? Yes, sir. And uh, by virtue of being your big brother and working at the video store, I got to meet Corey. He and his Card store. Regular. Card store. <laughs> Card store. Yeah. Going, going back. Yeah. Yeah. But we we all kind of bonded over movies. I mean, that was Corey and I would go to the theater pretty much like every Friday and see anything. Didn't matter what was even out. We didn't even look after a while. And we had we had a couple of those weekends where we just go see like three movies all in one sitting. We just hop from one theater to the next, and uh, man, and just had so much fun talking about movies, experiencing new movies and stuff. And I'm pretty sure it's carried on. I know for us. How about you, Corey? Oh yeah, so, absolutely. Movie lover. Too much of my life. <laughs> no, no, no. Just the right amount. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to know my viewing habits. Oh, wait, we'll talk about that in just a minute. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> uh, we brought Corey on today for a very special episode of McCloudy with a Chance of Decapitation, a.k.a. the Highlander franchise. <laughs> the sensation you're feeling is the quickening. Who are you? We are the same, McLeod. We are brothers! <laughs> it's going to be a good one. I'm sharpening my sword right now. You just say McCloudy with a chance of decapitation. <laughs> that's If we had podcast titles other than the film title, that would be it, because that's great. I think it <laughs> might be a bit long, but... <laughs> <laughs> Too good. Uh, and so before we get too deep into the Highlands, uh, I do want to suggest that everybody follows us, subscribes us, uh, and leave some reviews. We need mo reviews. Please, over on Apple Podcasts is the best place to do it, but anywhere you can drop a review. Bathroom wall, I don't care, as long as people see it. And do we have a special review we'd like to highlight? <laughs> For a good time, subscribe to... No, that's not how that works. Uh, yeah, we here's a good example if you need an idea of what a, re, a good review would sound like. Uh, our good friend Music Identity over on Apple Podcasts left this gem titled, If You Love Movies, you need to tune into this awesome podcast. The Sully Brothers, who I like to call the Super Sully Brothers, know their stuff when it comes to movies that are soon to have sequels or remakes. Lots of great humor as well as fun facts and info about the original movies each week. Tune in now. You will not be disappointed. Mm. That's nice. Thank you very we, much. We need more of those. Do it. Go live a review. What's the problem? All right, that was just the opening. Stay tuned for more throughout this episode as we answer some very important questions like... Magic or aliens? What's your Highlander? Is the director always right? Extra big question mark. And what title have fans jokingly given to Highlander 3? Hmm. I would think more jokes would be about the second one, but I think maybe it, <laughs> it gets so much <laughs> flack that uh, they had to move on and, and give some give some stuff to Highlander 3. Um, but first, <laughs> what you watching? Am I going first here? Um, yeah. yeah, talking about viewing habits, I, uh, I fill all the, the free time in with movies and television these days, and there's a lot of it. I just got hooked on the new Ted Lasso series on Apple Plus TV with Jason Sudeikis, which is 
hysterical. I'm loving every second of it. Jason Stakis is a genius. Uh, last week tonight with John Oliver. I can't get enough of that. I wish he was doing an episode every night. Uh, I just watched The Accountant, a uh, new movie with uh, Shia LaBeouf, or however you, Shia LaBeouf, however you say his name. Uh, he is scary in this one, and, and I like it. I like him Wait, all grows up. Isn't it uh, The Accountant's the one with uh, Ben Affleck? This is like, no. he's like the tax. Oh wait, I'm sorry, the tax something. collector. Tax yeah, collector. You You're right. You're right. I was Whatever. nervous. I was like, something to do with money. Did you not know that was Shia LaBeouf in the account? They're a crossover. <laughs> he crossover. was great. <laughs> no, you're it's right. It's Batman? called the tax collector. I, I mean, I know Sandra Bullock was in both of them, or she was supposed oh, to be. Originally cast. Originally cast. Yes. Which, by the way, last week you didn't make that joke. I I, I realized after the fact. <laughs> I know. It was implied. <laughs> <laughs> it, it always it's always there, waiting in the wings. Yeah. I went back and rewatched the entire Nolan Batman trilogy because mm. uh, there's been a lot of talk about Batman and the new The Batman with Robert Pattinson coming, and I wanted to refresh myself on the proper Batman, so I went back to that. Uh, and then I'm hooked on the series called Dr. Pole. Have you ever heard of Dr. Pole? This not. is not a setup. It sounds like a setup. Uh, this is just a, it's like a guy who's been a veterinarian for like 40 years out in the boonies, and there's like 17 seasons of this show. I think they make like what? four seasons a year. Uh, of this guy just going out and taking care of farm animals, like fixing them up and stitching them and oh. repairing injuries and taking care of kitties. I don't know. It's just like it, what you need soothing wise this time during all this craziness. Dr. Pole's got that. It's great. It makes me feel better to see all those little animals get healed up. Oh, I was afraid you were talking about the tax collector again, taking care of the animals. Yeah, Dr. Pole. It's a it's a euphemism. Uh huh. Uh, podcasts. I'm still listening to Mark Marin. I can't get enough of that. This week, uh, Giancarlo Esposito, because we've all been saying it wrong. Kerry Washington and Kieran really? Culkin. Kieran Culkin's a good one. Yeah, they have a whole thing about. It's not Giancarlo Esposito. It's Giancarlo Esposito. What? All right. That's I hope be... they weren't kidding, because I'm going to say it that way from now on. And look like <laughs> it an was idiot. just a mess with everybody. Yeah, they got me. They got me. Uh, more ID10T with Chris Hardwick. Uh, Listen to a really interesting one today talking about uh, collectibles and uh, pop culture um, auctions, which is very interesting. He was interviewing a couple of guys who have vast Star Wars collections and cell collections and how they're putting those up for auction. And uh, then gaming. I'm doing, you know, I'm still doing my Twitch thing. I'm still gaming regularly, uh, still playing Rocket League. I'm addicted to Fall Guys, although I've only got one win after like 400 tries. And uh, just downloaded and started playing yesterday the PGA Tour 2K21. Turns out I am equally as bad at digital golf as I am <laughs> at real golf. And people get to watch that live almost daily. Yeah, I uh, I love a good golf game. I haven't been playing. I used to play the heck out of Tiger Woods. And then uh, and then we had, uh, back of the old setup, we'd play P- we'd come on the Sega Genesis and play like PGA Tour 3. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Man, that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I haven't been playing a ton of stuff. I guess I don't know. Well, what? What? Uh, let's talk to Corey. What? What have you been watching lately? Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, it's just been crazy with obviously what we're looking at today. I've watched a lot of that, but uh, beyond that, I, I started the John Wick series over. Um, oh, I checked up uh, Upload. I think that's on Prime. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's pretty cool. That led me to Space Force because it's Greg Daniels and uh, Steve Carell. He Daniels did uh, Office, Parks and Rec, King of the Hill. Yeah, he was How SNL is it? writer. I've heard mixed stuff. It's, I like Space Force. It goes up and down. Yeah. It's like the first season of The Office and the first season of Parks and Rec. It takes a little while to get you involved. It's like a right. slow burn. I think that's his bread and butter. Uh, I checked out the movie The Goldfinch. I've been looking for it for a while, and it it's on Prime. It was well, how was that? Deep. I read the book. Did you like mm-hmm. the book? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the movie was I, great. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> I thought the characters were amazing, but it the story was there was hardly a story. Yeah, it the was, story it was strange. It was weird. I found out about that because of a podcast I've been listening to. In between this podcast, <laughs> it's uh, Team Deacons. It's uh, Roger Deacons. He's a cinematographer. Oh, yeah. Just, like, look him up. You're going to be blown away. Uh, and he goes through every little aspect of movie making, things that you just you didn't know were out there. 
and it's <laughs> it's amazing. But that was a movie he did recently. He did uh, 1918, which you know looks like it's a one take. Oh my gosh! It, just the technical difficulties and the pushing of the the boundary of what we're capable of in this day and age is amazing. And to hear this guy who's been in the business forever talk about meeting those those challenges, it's been amazing. So uh, yeah, I watched that 1918. It was yeah, visual. It was wild. God, it's gorgeous. I. Uh, you know, I'm in Houston, so I get a sneak peek every once in a while before anybody's even heard of a movie. And that was one of them. I got to see it about two months before it came out, and I was blown away. So it introduced me, reintroduced me to uh, Roger Deakins, and I was just amazed by what, what the human eye has not caught up to technology. But this guy, man, he, he explains it in such a way that you're interested in deeper level of movies. It's kind of like what you guys are doing. I'm finding new things and we're learning new things every week. Um, let's see what else. Kids have me watching Adventure Time, which I'm an older man, so it feels weird, but you got to love it. Short, quick episodes. And I know we've got some new stuff coming out on uh, HBO's new platform. So... I'm looking forward to that when we finish the series. But that's about everything I've been checking out. That's just today, right? Like the yeah, last couple just days. This morning. <laughs> just this morning. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, you guys have been uh, way more active than me. I, I feel like I haven't been watching hardly anything. We we uh, were rewatching Scrubs because uh, we never really finished the series. So we always enjoyed it. So we're in like season two now. Man, there's a lot of episodes per season. Um I did fin. I know I'm all over the place in Umbrella Academy, but I finished this the season two. It keeps pulling me back in, so whatever. I'm not even gonna fight it anymore. I guess I'll just keep watching that show. Um, <laughs> Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Uh, love yeah. it every time. Can't get enough. Tina Turner. Blaster, just, blaster. Yeah, she's so amazing. Um, and yeah, I listen to a few podcasts here and there. I've uh, been doing some writing about 37,000 words in on Ghost City, so approaching the midway point. I'm shooting for 90, so that'll be nice to get there. Uh, Is my, 90,000 an average book? Uh, for this uh, genre, it's like a science fiction thriller, so 90 should be respectable. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but hoping to do a first draft by my birthday, so not a ton of time. So I got to keep keep booking it. <laughs> um, but uh, the, <laughs> he cracked himself up <laughs> yeah. with puns like these. It's sure to be a bestseller. Um, <laughs> I don't have a great segue, so I'm going to go straight into the behind the scenes segment. Uh, I want to talk about director's cuts and all the different kind of cuts that we get for our movies. <laughs> As we know from Alan Smithy, the pseudonym used by directors wanting to separate themselves from their own films, a director does not always have final cut. Those of you shouting for the Snyder Cut will understand and be rewarded next year with his vision of Justice League. Director's cuts are a dangerous game, however. They aren't always the best version of a movie and don't always genuinely involve the director or present their intended version of the film. Ridley Scott said on the commentary of Alien that the original theatrical release was his director's cut, and the new version was simply released as a marketing ploy. James Cameron spoke about the special editions for his film, stating, What I put into theaters is the director's cut. Nothing was cut that I didn't want cut. All the extra scenes we've added back in are just a bonus for the fans. We often think of director's cuts as lengthier versions of the film, and part of the appeal of these added minutes is seeing new footage. But the overall movie may not improve through these extensions. They may actually degrade the end product. Star Wars fans arguing over who really shot first, know what I mean. <laughs> this is the where you shout out. <laughs> Jar Jar shot first. <laughs> Other alternate version movies result in a fundamental change in tone or actually alter the endings, which ultimately creates a completely new movie. Think of The Abyss, 
where the aliens go from lovable water nymphs to threatening global destruction or Scott's removal of the studio-imposed happy ending for Blade Runner. I also think of movies like 1408, where the ending difference is literally life or death for John Cusack's character. Not all director's cuts even rely on what was filmed during production. Richard Donner's recut of Superman 2 used screen test footage of Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder, as well as footage used from the first Superman movie. Special editions, extended editions... With this ability to create so many different versions of films, audiences can get lost in the naming conventions and not really know what they're getting. Blade Runner has at least eight different versions of the movie, and with sales of every new version, it's questionable if we're rewarding good or bad behavior. I hope that fans of Justice League get the movie they've been hoping for, but don't be surprised when all you really get is another marketing ploy. When you said... Uh, when you jumped in on director's cut, the first thing that comes to mind for me is The Abyss. I like the director's cut a lot, but I've talked to people who think it ruins the movie. I thought it made it better, but that's just me. Remind me how the director's cut ended. Well, in the in the original one, you basically it's left up for grabs as to what they found at the bottom, but in the director's cut, they extend that and show their entire ship, uh, the alien okay. ship surfacing and the global impact that them being there had had. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now, so well, the the ship still surfaces in both versions. The difference is, so when he goes down to the abyss, uh, the the deep part of the ocean, he's taken into that little cavern where they save him. But then, basically, they've been monitoring their activity as a species and saying they're very dangerous uh, and ultimately threaten to destroy all of them. They bring in these huge waves from the ocean and it has all these different uh, like Independence Day style scenes where everybody's running for their lives. And then, like, at the last minute, um, stop, his, right? it's basically, yeah, because he talks about, well, it's kind of like a Fifth Element, I think, where he's, like, essentially, uh, humans' ability to love is what makes us an okay species. And then, uh, yeah, they stop. Like, and, and you know what? The effects look pretty good. Like, the waves literally stop yeah. as they're about to crash on onto the shores. But, yeah, it does change the feel of the movie. Like, you... yeah where it was cool that they just happened to be on the planet and, you know, they didn't really want to interact with us. And I think that's kind of neat. Um, but then this one is like, they've been watching and waiting. And it really takes it creepy. more from like E.T. where it's just one little bit to, like you said, to like Independence Day where it's a global threatening thing. Yeah. It's like if yeah. E.T.'s parents came down guns a-blazing, where's my kid? <laughs> I want to see that. Uh, right. <laughs> actually, Keep I would see that me. too. Don't try to sell me those Reese's pieces. <laughs> that's the only yeah. redeeming quality this whole planet had. The candy. That's why they don't. That's why they don't. You couldn't even give planet. me M&Ms. <laughs> now pieces. they have peanut butter M&Ms. We solved that. Mm. <laughs> They're the yeah. best. That was a bad move. I, I caught that reference there, Corey. Uh... <laughs> So we have a lot to talk about. Um, no kidding. There is so many Highlanders, and um, to go with more puns here, uh, <laughs> our good friend Corey sort of threw himself on his sword to uh, to, to take one for the team here to watch all of these. <laughs> There's so many. Uh, yeah, I did not watch all of them. Uh, but we'll, I thought we'll there was only one. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, there should have been, right? Did you start in 2018 with this research? Because that's a lot of hours. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so I, I want to go through, I'm not going to go through in detail like I normally would for all of these. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the detail of the first one and then kind of give little highlights. And then we'll get into conversation on, on what we actually thought about it. So, so we'll start off with Highlander. Uh, synopsis here, in case you don't know. An immortal Scottish swordsman must confront the last of his immortal opponent, a murderously brutal barbarian who lusts for the fabled prize. Uh, this stars Christopher Lambert, who we might have seen in Greystroke, Fortress, Gunman, Mortal Kombat, Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance. Uh, Sean Connery, which you should know, but he was uh, in several James Bonds. He was in The Man Who Would Be King, Outland, The Untouchables, The Rock, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Clancy Brown, who's awesome. Uh, he was in the Shawshank Redemption, Starship Troopers, and he does tons of voice work. Uh, notably, he's Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob. Uh, he's also wow. Savage Opress on Star Wars, The Clone Wars, Lex Luthor and Bane, and Mr. Freeze on the Batman cartoon series. Uh, then we've got Roxanne Hart, 
who played uh, Lily Davalos on Medium, the TV series, and mm-hmm. she's done a ton of walk-on roles on lots of other television. She should, you've probably seen her appear in something and may not have put together who she was. There's also B.D. Edney, Al North, and Sheila Gish. This was directed by Russell Mulcahy, who I'm calling a music video king. This guy must have done over 60 different music videos in the 70s and 80s for bands uh, from like ACDC to Paul McCartney. Uh, lots of Duran Duran, he did Elton John, and of course he did some Queen videos, which makes sense. Um, now we get we understand probably the relationship of, of why they did the soundtrack for Highlander. Uh, he also directed uh, uh, Ricochet, if you remember that one. Oh, I um, love that with, movie. Yeah, it's great. Uh, the Real McCoy, The Shadow, which I think Corey likes that one too, but it's it's actually one of my favorite comic book movies. Like I think it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and underrated not a lot of people have seen that so i am recommending you go see the shadow it's got alec baldwin in it um it takes place in like the 30s and it's just a cool style and uh really embraces it and the effects are really good too there's there's cool stuff happening in there uh he also directed resident evil extinction which i think is one of the ones i like (laughs) there's so many of those too (laughs) that I, i can't really remember uh and he did 39 episodes of teen wolf from 2011 to 2017 uh, writers of this are Gregory Wyden, who did uh, a lot of the Prophecy uh, franchise uh, movies, and he did Backdraft as well. Uh, there's also the combo uh, writing team Peter Bellwood and Larry Ferguson, who worked on Beverly Hills Cop 2, The Presidio, The Hunt for Red October, and Alien 3. So pretty good stuff from those guys in there. And uh, this came out in 1986. The big stuff at the theaters at that time were Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Golden Child, Aliens, and Topped It. Uh, at the charts there, Top Gun was number one at the box office, uh, which you should have listened to our earlier podcast, and you would have known that. Uh, box office here, this, you, you did. <laughs> Good. We've got our one fan listening that to review? the show. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> you can type it now while I'm talking. Uh, this only did $12.9 million, uh, at the box office on a $16 million budget. It's pretty generally agreed upon that this was more of a cult hit, something that uh, kind of came into its own on video. And it's got a rating of 69%. So overall, not not too bad. You know, it didn't make tons of money at the, at the box office, but uh, people like this movie a lot, and I do too, and we'll get into that. But somehow then got 32 we go sequels. to yeah. Then we go into <laughs> what has uh, been s- described as one of the worst films ever made, uh, Highlander Two: The Quickening. Uh, this takes uh, Highlander Connor McCloud uh, trying to prevent the destruction of Earth under an anti-ozone shield. Uh, we get Chris Lambert again, Sean Connery. Now we get Virginia Madsen, who's uh, always a great addition to the story. Um. Yeah, it's very good. Michael Ironside, Alan Rich, and John C. McGinley, also directed by Russell Mulcahy. And um, I'm probably going to skip through on some of the other stuff. This came out in 1991. Has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 0%. Whoa! That is That's impressive possible? by itself. <laughs> Apparently it is. Uh, then we move on to Highlander, The Final Dimension, a.k.a. The Sorcerer. Uh, Connor McCloud awakens from a peaceful life when an entombed immortal magician comes seeking the Highlander. We get Chris again, Mario Van Peebles, Deborah Kara Unger, and Mako, uh, who you've seen in like uh, probably like the um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger um, Conan. Conan movies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, directed by Andrew Morahan, which uh, I think this is one of maybe three movies he did. He also mostly did music videos. Um, this came out in 94, 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it, a big jump from the last movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, this crosses over uh, to when the Highlander series was happening. That's starring Adrian Paul as Duncan McLeod, another immortal from the same clan. And that aired from 92 to 98. There's also an animated series in there from 94 to 96. I know anybody who watch that and is listening to this podcast it's uh let us know what you think i cory watch watch some of it and i think uh, he's gonna have some something to talk about but uh there was also a spinoff show highlander the raven that was from 98 to 99 pretty short-lived then movies continue that if you didn't get enough highlander there's more highlander endgame Uh, Immortals Connor and Duncan McCloud must join forces against Kel, an evil immortal who has become too strong for anyone to face alone. 
Uh, this is sort of the passing the torch uh, movie where it's got Chris Lambert and Adrian Paul, who was from the series. Uh, then some other people, I believe, from the series, Bruce Payne, Lisa Barbuscia, Donnie Yen, Jim Burns, and Peter Wingfield, directed by Douglas Arianakoski. Ariana Sorry. Sorry, Doug. Um, <laughs> that came out in 2000. Better rating, 11%. Uh, then we're out of the theaters. There is a sci-fi release, Highlander the Source, Duncan McLeod. We're, we've fully on past the torch. It's all Duncan uh, his fellow immortals quest to locate the grail of their world. That's Adrian Paul, Tecla Rutan, Christian Solomano, Peter Wingfield, and Jim Burns, directed by Brett Leonard. That came out in 2007. Uh, and no ratings there because it was at the box office. Now, also in 2007, there's an animated film, Highlander, The Search for More Money, for Vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just want to give kind of a summary of the of the movies that actually went to the theater movies one through four the total franchise box office was 81 million sounds okay the total franchise budget 91 million why'd they keep so, trying this is the mystery <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot to talk about well let's you know let's start at the beginning from the dawn of time we came Moving silently down through the centuries, living many secret lives, struggling to reach the time of the gathering, when the few who remain will battle to the last. No one has ever known we were among you. Until now. We, we at least all watched the first Highlander. Um, what are your thoughts there, brother? Uh, you know, honestly... The one thing I kept thinking as I as I plunged further and further down this rabbit hole was there's good bones here. Like this the the idea behind it all is the kind of thing you dream of when you're building a sci-fi franchise or a series. And that is something that you can go back to the well over and over and over again and have a good story. And it's like I joke, why did they keep trying? I think they knew they had the good bones and they were just trying to capitalize on it, but never could quite get it right. And I think the first mistake they made was their lead character, was their lead actor. Because <laughs> the more I, I research about it, like he was, he barely spoke any English. He he didn't seem like a strong actor. He wasn't overly like ripped or, or I personally don't think he was like, you know, as good looking as some other lead men at the time. Like, I don't know who he knew or was related to. But I personally think he was the reason this whole franchise was in the pooper for a long time. They they brought in Sean Connery, great addition, and the, and I actually watched some guy's review online, and he's like, "Well, Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert really did. They they acted off each other real well. No, no, no. Sean Connery acted real well. Everybody else did a decent job around him and didn't bring him down. <laughs> Sean yeah. Connery's the man. Like we were so distracted by actual acting that we just ignored yeah. everybody else around him. Yeah, good point. So I I felt. It was a struggle to watch them all. I felt like the first one for sure was was a stronger film, but could have been so much better given the right opportunities. Uh, and this is the first time I've watched it since I was a kid, since when I first found out the Highlander series existed working at the video store, I think. Uh, didn't hate it. Didn't love it. If I had to rank just the first one, I'd probably give it like two and a half, three stars. Uh, at most and then the others i'm not even going to attempt i i literally just started them and started laughing and was doing other things at the same time i'm not normally harsh but geez <laughs> rough okay <laughs> yeah um I, I think uh i think maybe Corey's gonna have a lot more to say because he uh has uh, a, b a better perspective on all these as a whole um so what do you what do you think though if you if you could isolate just the first one as as a film from the franchise Corey like is this standalone is it a, is it a good movie is it yeah standalone I think it's a it's a great movie but I'm also uh, looking through rose colored glasses I was probably eight my dad let me see it a little too early <laughs> um, it, it goes back to my heritage my dad was born in Japan. And we're of Scottish lineage, so I was like, ooh, sci-fi about two things that I understand a little tiny bit about. So I was into it, but yeah, I, I'm looking back now, it's, 
I don't know how anything else came after the first. And, you know, I, <laughs> I want to be on the receiving end of some residuals if something like this comes out of my future. Because <laughs> they kept pouring money into a money pit. But, yeah. I, but I still love swords and Scottish people and you know, Japanese swords that have no business being anywhere. <laughs> that's, that's my biggest takeaway from this first one is they, they set it up, like Chris said, to be something great. And then they wrote themselves into a corner. They, they don't have anywhere to go. And that shows in your next couple movies. <laughs> yeah, that that was, if by itself, a much better movie when it when it becomes part of a franchise. You're right. They painted themselves into a corner. They, they ended it. <laughs> They're like, well, yeah. he won. So show's over. Show's and, uh, over. Yeah, and then it was so obvious moving into the second one. They were just trying. Well, they were doing a cool a couple of things. One, they're like, "Well, uh, yeah, I know Sean Connery died, and uh, uh, Connor wins the prize, but <laughs> how do we get him back? <laughs> do they really? I mean, now can you unwin the prize? Can he just come back from the dead? It's cool. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they they uh, they wrote a decent film and then needed to expand on the universe and the story and didn't know how to. And and part of the problem, well, I guess I'm moving into the second one here, but it 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 um they from what I read, like basically the biggest thing that fans wanted to know is more details about how did these immortals come to be and who they were. And then when they got their answers, they didn't like it. No. So, <laughs> so it turns out we did want more mystery, and I think that's a big part for me if I'm gonna go to comparing uh, the first one to the second one is that the first one is magic and fantasy and fun. Tell me, how did it happen, for God's sake? Why does the sun come up? Hmm? Or are the stars just pinholes in the curtain of night? Who knows? We get a lot of the mystery and we're comfortable with it. And the second one is like sci-fi and they... they shovel the the uh the uh the details down your throat and here's exactly you know there's several scenes that it's like people just explaining over and over again like there's that part with virginia madsen where she literally takes us back through what we just learned probably like <laughs> 10 minutes prior and it's so obvious that it's it, it's it's an effort to explain again to the audience in case they're lost and uh it's not that we were lost it's just that we were like eh, really that's what you're doing okay uh, yeah, and th that's that's part of the, the question here is like, and so many of these move on and ignore Highlander too. Like when you when you watch <laughs> the other ones, they they're they're openly like, yeah, that one didn't happen. That's our Rocky Five, right? They just kind of let's let's just let's just move on. Let's not let's not acknowledge that one. And that's probably the right move because nobody really likes the second one. But for the for the first one though, I, I still like it a lot. I, I uh, it is, it, it's like just between a B movie and a legit like theater release. Yeah, I like the action. Like the sword fighting is this old like it's um it's not clumsy but it's slow. It's not what we're used to now. It's it's um now we're used to everything's a fast paced fast cut thing where you can hardly see what's happening. This was like you could tell it was legitimately guys trying to heft these swords against each yes. other. And it's n it's not easy to do, but I kind of like that. I like that we get to see that it's a tiresome act. Like a half the time is they deflect and then run away or something, you know. <laughs> and I think that's more a legit sword fight. What it would be, um, and so I think that's I think that's kind of nice. I I it is a shame that it ends where he wins because then yeah it's not open ended anymore but i like the ending i like that he wins so, you know he defeats the the big eagle kurgan um and the i i still like the effects too like i know they're cheesy i know they're outdated yeah. but i think they work really well um and i'm i'm surprised honestly they didn't do another release where they came back and and redid all the effects and stuff uh, maybe they still will. I say you act like it's not possible. We might get yeah. that next year. Somebody yeah. does it at home on their Apple. Well, that, yeah. That's your renegade version of two. <laughs> yeah, God. but I but I would still. Um, I, I wanted to actually revisit our 
our idea on the uh, stars there because I, I was kind of struggling to stick to what we had defined um, uh, as far as whether or not it would be something I'd rewatch uh, voluntarily, not just for the show, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then possibly recommend. And so I'm honest, I'm 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 probably around like three three and a half stars for the first one, just because I feel like it um it's between a one watcher and another uh rewatch and it does have enough action um for action fans uh, and also the fantasy element and, you know there's a love story in there too which is which is nice uh, but for the second one i guess we can move on into that uh yeah well you, you tell us what what you're thinking there i i was like watching it, I knew in advance. I kind of wish I hadn't heard what a what a absolute dumpster fire it was in advance, uh, because I knew what the overall story was going to be. So I'm mm-hmm. watching it, and I'm like, they seriously did this, and I was really like, okay, if you're a fan watching this for the first time back in the what eighty nine when it came out or whatever ninety ninety one, uh, like I was struggling. Like, where does this reside in the timeline? Like, did did they just Bill and Ted their way from when they first met to the future? <laughs> And with a chance to get back, and they try to pigeonhole this into a back part of the story. I even Googled Highlander timeline. There isn't one because no one can explain what the hell happened in two. It's ridiculous. Therefore, I sentence you both to this same exile. An exile into the future. What? I don't understand other than what I get back to from my original comments, and that was there were good bones. They thought they just messed up on the first one. Let's come back. Hey, the same guys are available. Sean Connery's not stupid is is stupid enough to say he'll come back. So let's let's get Lambert back. He still looks the same. Let's throw some aliens and some time travel in there. Same special effects. Oh, and a hoverboard. Let's put that in there. Uh, Yeah, let's do that. This we now we got it. Let's uh, let's dome the Earth and do it. And then, no, it did not. It's like 0% Rotten Tomato score. I don't know what happened there either. I was puzzled the entire time. Uh, I laughed out loud multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't meant it was to be a comedy. comedy. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I um, honestly, when it first started, like I, I knew it was poorly rated. I didn't know it was that poorly rated. But uh, I was I was determined to be as open as possible to uh, to, to receive it. And... Uh, I was enjoying it like the first 10 minutes or so. I'm like, you know, this this looks okay. Um the pacing seems okay. I uh I'm all right with the storyline that they're doing with the shield around the earth, fine, whatever. It feels like that was a script that was about uh a shield around the earth and then they kind of cobbled together that it was a Highlander. Um, it's a Cloverfield movie. situation. Right. Yeah. It's a Cloverfield situation. The paradox, yeah. And, uh, but, but parts of it, like the look of it, I felt like, um, it was, uh, uh, kind of reminded me of Tim Burton's Batman, uh, the huh. look of it, like the city and the, uh, cinematography and stuff. And I, I liked that. Uh, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, Batman came out two years before it and I think they purposely mm-hmm. tried to copy it. Um, but this movie gets worse as it goes on. Like every minute just gets more excruciating. <laughs> Uh, Michael Ironside, I love that guy, but uh, he acknowledges how awful this is. The villains in it and him are just so comical and not not fun comical. They're just dumb. Uh, they're a big part of what ruins the movie. Sean Connery's underutilized. Uh, I don't really know why they brought him back other than to say that Sean Connery was in it. Uh, mm-hmm. That was obviously, you know, you look at the cover of the first Highlander and it actually is Christopher Lambert on there the second one is equal uh you know uh dedication to who's in this and sean connery's half the cover uh but he's in his like comic relief and becomes kind of an obi-wan style supporting role uh ironside's dialogue is i think he even said something it might be in the trivia it's like uh, if you were to ask a like a 10 year old boy to write an action movie (laughs) villain (laughs) <laughs> These are the things that he would write. The remains of your mortal wife. So frail. So very dead. It's just so bad. He's, he says things like, uh, it's hard to find good help. If you yep. want something 
done right, do it yourself. Like this is this this is the throwaway dialogue nobody actually puts out. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, if there's anything I, I learned from the first two movies, is that immortals get the ladies. Uh, oh, all you have to yeah. do is tell somebody that you live forever and you're getting some action. I don't understand that at all. Like, how or let them that? see you get the quickening. Yeah, because right. that's what happens with Virginia Madison. <laughs> yep, in the street, in front of everybody. Yeah. They didn't yeah. even like. He just glanced go- at her, and all of a sudden, she's up against a brick wall. What the. Yeah, that's impressive, especially for Christopher Lambert, because I agree, he's not a great-looking guy. Um, but yeah, the second one's just, it's its pretty abysmal. What what are your thoughts there, Corey? I, I agree. My favorite part is um, when Sean Connery's trying to get a new suit. <laughs> that's oh my God. like the most, <laughs> I, I felt like I was you. actually watching a movie. Yeah, and he hands out that <laughs> earring that's somehow still attached to his head. <laughs> I mean... Forgive me for ignoring all the other magic and uh, focus on that, but I, I don't know. I, I was excited when it was a kid because I was like, oh, the music is still a little bit of the same. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I remember leaving the theater. My dad, we were like, hey, let's go find the soundtrack. Doesn't exist. <laughs> it's, a, it's a couple Queen albums cobbled together and, you know... Even then, I knew it wasn't what it could have been. And then with all the re-edits and crazy stuff over the years, it is marginally better, but it's it's a cash grab. It's, hey, we have this available. Let's film all this crazy stuff. Like you were talking about the scenery. Um, that's all Argentina. That's just, they save money. And, oh, we have access to this for nothing? Okay. Let's use this dam for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a weird movie. Don't know what uh, in your trivia, but, I mean, it's basically been erased from existence. <laughs> I was surprised I, I could find it on one of the streaming services, honestly. When I saw, watched the first one, I was like, uh, let's see if two's even out there where I can get to it. Or am I going to yeah. have to buy it off Amazon? And it was on, I think, HBO I, Max. I found it on Prime. Yeah, oh, no, Prime that was Prime. Me. That's right. It's the ones after that. Yeah, yeah. But okay. they have retitled the movie. It's The Quickening, but this is the Renegade cut. It's not the original garbage. So this is the best we're going to oh. get out of this. It's awful. <laughs> oh, my God. I'll never watch yeah. the original. It, See, well, you wasn't. can't unless you have a VH, VHS. They didn't uh, put it out there digitally, at least in my research. Oh, see, I I watched. Uh, this was not the Renegade version, so this was still they. they That's re- went. They've all been Alien retitled. Oh, they've all okay. been retitled. The quickening. I I checked the uh, time, so the Renegade version is like 109 minutes. The original yeah. was 89. So just that's. I went I went down a deep rabbit hole <laughs> to to find out if I could see both versions. So I was and, disappointed. So for people listening like i think that the big difference uh from theatrical to this what they call the renegade version which is uh probably the coolest thing that actually came out of highlander is that that calling something a renegade version yeah uh, that's that's pretty badass um but uh <laughs> the, the main difference is that in the theatrical version they are aliens from another planet that are sent Zeist. forward in time to right to earth <laughs> Right, and then yep. the the renegade version, they're not aliens; they're just m- magical beings from, from the an old far past. time, from the past, who are sent forward in time to Earth. What I don't understand if if you're sending them to an alien planet, why do they also have to go to the future? <laughs> he up the difficulty level. How, how does that matter at that. all? We and, have the technology. Yeah, yeah, and. There's a flaw. If if he sent, if you're all immortal, which or they weren't all immortal, but a lot of them were, um, and you send somebody forward in time, eventually you're going to catch up to them. Like so, right? Like if you don't yeah. die. Well, that's another thing. That's going to be embarrassing. Every version, it sounds like only some of the people were immortal. Yeah, but when they sent them to Earth, they they became immortal. I don't. That's a lot of hoops to jump. Was it the yellow sun? 
Yeah, it could that be. Do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah wait, that wait the, the yellow thing. sun was blocked out by a dome, so never mind. That theory yeah, is dead. No, no. <laughs> Right. You're right. That's why they were able to get their heads chopped off. <laughs> well, that's that whole scene with Virginia Madsen where she's explaining all of the details and she's like, Okay, so you're you were immortal yeah. and then you're not. And then yeah. these people came here and now because they're immortal and you're now immortal, but until they all die, then you'll be immortal again. And yeah. I'm surprised no, she you didn't just say I just read that this morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's a uh, dark helmet. He's like, you got that. <laughs> you know, I always have my coffee when I'm looking at radar. <laughs> oh, All right, man. so the second one, no good, low star rating, um, and pretty much ruinous for the first one. But then they move on, and they say, okay, we're just gonna ignore number two. And this is Highlander, the final dimension uh, that I know that I did see a while back. Um, and I remember liking it, but that may have only been a comparison to, <laughs> to having known about <laughs> Highlander 2. Uh, and, but Corey has seen, he, he's recently watched all these. But you watched the third one too, did you? I am about halfway through it. Because I, I was right. thinking before this, I'm like, let me, I'm going to just go give it a little bit of a shot and see. Honestly, the, the production quality seemed a lot better. The. The filming seemed better. Mario and Viv Van Peoples was a good addition because he's a good actor. I don't know. They had him doing a Batman voice. I think Christian Bale watched that mm. before he did his Batman uh, for Nolan because uh, <laughs> yeah. it was very similar. He just needed a little more gravel in his voice for Batman. But, and a better haircut. Um, I like the – I forget the lead actress's name in that one, but she was another another win for the Immortals, another beautiful woman involved. Yeah. Um, She's in the yes. game. Deborah. That's where you've seen her. That's her. Good call. Yep, I like her a lot. She's she's beautiful. Um, oh, yeah, she's. But great. I didn't finish it. I want to finish it after the podcast and see because I, I feel like it was going in a better direction in some aspects, but I don't have high hopes for the way they wrap it up. Okay. So you saw cool. the whole thing though, Corey. Yeah. So I don't want to burst your bubble <laughs> or get you disappointed <laughs> before you get there, <laughs> but uh, it it <laughs> continues that trend of. Gosh, we made something. We got to get it out there, and it it didn't go anywhere. It landed flat, but it that follows the rest of the series. That it's it's a trend, which I don't know of any other sci-fi series that does this. So, again, I don't know if this is a trivia for you, Matt, but uh, we're just going to continue as we move on to forget what's in between one and whatever we're currently filming or putting out there. They it's carved so themselves weird. out a real niche. Yeah. <laughs> I, isn't it, um, maybe not each one forgets its, its predecessor, but I, I think if I read correctly, each one has its own kind of thing where it doesn't fully, like it never really seemed to define the canon completely. Is that, is that accurate yeah, to say for the but, series? Yeah. Yeah, I think you can look at that both ways. Uh, that they forget what came before, and you're right. They, there's a new canon. Like in this one, he has a son that's adopted. the The woman from the first movie is killed off screen before the events start. Uh, which you know, I like when you can bring back an actor, actress, and it gives some continuity, even in something crazy like this. And they did yeah. this with one of the cop characters. He's supposed to have been in the first one, and I'm not sure if he's that patrol officer that's like, you talk funny, Nash, um, <laughs> or whatever the line is, but there, he's got a vendetta to come after him, and then, you know, it just it goes sideways. The, the big thing in this movie, Chris, I don't know if you're this far, uh, has Mario Vin Peebles come out of the fu into the future? Has he come out from his past? Yes, yeah, yeah. He's he's okay. already uh, gone to New York and gotten a hooker. That's what oh I'm yes, at. that yeah. right away. <laughs> that's, that's what you do. Chew the <laughs> condom up and spit it out. <laughs> I was like, what is this, Coneheads? Um, <laughs> this this lost me in the theater because I remember the first one. We're like, okay, he's got the prize, and now you're telling me he got the prize because 
three immortals were locked in a, a mountain for several hundred years, a thousand, couple, no, no, several hundred, hundred, hundred uh-huh. years. Sorry. <laughs> and it like, they're still on earth, right? I mean, we're, yep. we're not jumping back to being aliens, aliens. So I don't know. They just, it irritated me. But again, like I was told you in the beginning, it had the little Japanese element. So I was like, Ooh, here we go. How here's, here's how you got that sword that, I think you lifted off of Sean Connery. So, you know, okay, you've got that. Cool. But the, the it just fell flat even with all the money that they put into it. It didn't go anywhere. And I, I think you're right. It's Chris. Christopher Lambert. <laughs> yep. And mm. he was like, oh, I'm in other movies now. I don't really care. I think a lot of the direction for Lambert was, hey, stare off into the distance that way. We're going to catch you from just at an angle, and we're going to record that for about 45 minutes and just slice it into the film. I think that's what happened with most of the most of his scenes. <laughs> from what I'm yeah. hearing, his eyesight is so poor, he didn't know the camera was rolling. Wow. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and he couldn't wear his glasses while he was on there. Yeah, and <laughs> people got hurt, too, because of it. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. We'll get to that in trivia, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, it, he he did win the prize, but it's taken back because uh, Van Peebles comes back, or he didn't Basically. actually win the prize. Well, he okay. he didn't actually. But so we've added it this whole like new it. element. Uh, el- what words? Uh, this whole new element of magic that that's why it's called the sorcerer in Europe. Mm. That that comes from the Japanese from is Mako. Is that his name? Sounds right. Um, yeah. It, it's not explained. It's just, okay, he okay. can shape shift and do all this cool stuff that Connor has never seen anyone else in his 400 plus years <laughs> do anything like that. And then now Mario Van Peebles can do it because he took his head and it just. Yeah. It Well, and, and then, uh, so again, it goes back to. Writing the first one where well yeah writing but but the first one where they're not aliens they're just right. kind of yeah magical that's gone. dudes which and I, um, I I thought this was okay with the sorcery but it was it happened so quick and then we left it alone if you're a sorcerer you can get out of a freaking mountain like turn into a cockroach and crawl through the rocks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they still had to fight with swords r- sure. rather than him just like yeah. shooting up something out of his hand and cutting off well, his head. Right. Just wishing so he, his head would come off. He pops out <laughs> in modern day with two other immortals, sends mm-hmm. one off to do his bidding, and cuts the other one's head right there. Why didn't you do that 400 years ago? Because <laughs> the scene where McLeod is, is there in the mountain before it crumbles... He he's not too far off from being in the Highlands himself. He's still in a kilt. He's, you know, fairly young in the game. And I don't want to pick at him because I want to make movies. But this is hard to watch. It's hard to explain why they continue to get money. It's it's yeah. like someone came from the future because we can jump in time in this in this life in this uh, scenario, right? It's like somebody came from the future and said, "You keep making the mo- these movies. One of them's going to make a billion dollars, dude, <laughs> eventually." And they so they just keep making them, hoping that that's the one. But every time they're wrong. Well, yeah, I, I but but and that's but but part of what's happening at this time too. So this is um, ninety four, two years prior. They were switching off away from Christopher Lambert. Sure. So the the series had started in 92 with Adrian Paul. And um, I'd seen a couple episodes of that. I think you'd watched more uh, in high school when it was yeah. when it was on for us. Um, and he, well, he was better in pretty much every way <laughs> than compared <laughs> well, to Christopher a, Lambert. Well, he was a rounded character. He grew yeah. and there's a joke online that if you, if somebody, and I think somebody has done this, if you go back and watch all of his uh, flashbacks, it makes a complete arc, character arc for for Duncan, and he becomes like somebody you'd want to watch in adventuring throughout the time. <laughs> he grows and he's got a heart. It was oh yeah, for six years. How many? Six. Cool. 
Was yeah. that that was was that standard television with like twenty episode seasons, or was that more of a like TNT where there was shorter seasons? No, they had that... quite a few until the last two two seasons. Ah, dang, I didn't realize. I remember seeing the, the commercials for it, but I wasn't involved enough at that time to want to watch it. Was that late nineties to early two thousands or ninety two and ninety eight? Yeah, that didn't make sense. That was at a time where I was too busy to be watching much except Seinfeld. Reruns, <laughs> you were working. So. Yeah, I was in college, a busy man. Well, but, and so, the, and and uh, Lambert did show up in one or two episodes. One episode. Right? One episode, okay. Oh. Just, I mean, just to, again, 119 episodes, give or take a few, because I know Duncan wasn't in every episode. Okay. It's interesting that they were crossing between film and television. Nobody else was really doing that. Now that's what, become more uh, something well, Even like now we've had a hard do. time. You're talking about in the last couple episodes, uh, Agents of Shield. Yes, and that I love that show, but it never really, other than a few mentions here and there, didn't yep. didn't do it. And this show was able to do it, and there that'll go into your next uh, couple of films. <laughs> Maybe we should have had, had Highlander cross over to Agents of Shield. Maybe that would have helped Highlander along. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's time travel, superpowers, magic. Why not aliens? Why not? It had it all. It's got it. And all. so. Um, are are we the the series itself is pretty much though sticking with the idea most of the ideas from the first one, uh, first movie? Yeah. Uh, or so. does it introduce any new concepts? So it's or it's got some new concepts. They're not aliens, right? No, they're not aliens. Uh, Watchers are a thing. So it's me and you basically have devoted our lives uh, to to monitor certain immortals and kind of do a kill count and all the background. There's way more than that, but that's a <laughs> for our purposes today. Yeah, that's huh. pretty good. But there's some other little. Uh, it, it definitely ignores the prize because there's hundreds of immortals still alive in the late '90s. It's a lot of period stuff, so it's it's interesting. I think that was a draw for the lead actor. He wanted to dress yeah. up and be an actor and other things. Well, that's a that's a great idea for. The series is because yeah. you can tell so many stories. I mean, this man's lived for hundreds of years, so he well, has even a lot that. Of to say. They've pigeonholed themselves because for for the the term Highlander, these guys only started around the late 15, 1600s, and then up to our current time. They're the uh, animated movie later on, and if you want to discuss that, that actually starts with. Uh, the Romans invading England and Brit- uh, Britannia. So <laughs> that's hundreds and hundreds of years before Connor and the rest of the McClouds. Well, didn't Sean Connery's character Ramirez say that he was like 1,500 years old or something insane like that? So I'm going to be a nerd and say it's closer to 3,000. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's like 2,500 years old. Or something. There you go. So, so yeah. they, they tried to fact explain that away. Forever. Yeah. And we don't but, know who... May actually be the oldest. Could be. Uh, what, they talk about or... that in the series. It's a guy oh, okay. named Mythos, and he shows up in the last two movies. He's kind of like uh, Interview with a Vampire. Armand I was about to say, around. all this reminds me a lot of vampire lore. That, and that's you even kind of used been... the term uh, Watcher, which comes yeah. from Buffy the Vampire Slayer sure. in my world. Uh, oh, yeah. Which was a big deal. It, it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of parallels between their longevity and their, their power. Well, you, you know. think about how they get their power as a vampire. You've got to take the blood from the neck. Mm. Yeah. You've got to take somebody's head. Somebody was really high and into <laughs> vampire lore and was like, ah, let's add swords, man. And then we got Highlander. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're basically drinking their souls, right? That's yeah, what the quickening right. is. So the animated series, uh, this goes from 94 to 96. So again, some overlap here. Um, not only with the movies, but with the television show. Yeah. Uh, who is this Duncan McLeod? Is this Connor this McLeod? This is, oh, my notes. Um, a descendant. A... Okay. Further down the line, um, Colin McLeod, I believe. Okay. I may have this wrong. That's on show. brand. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be a McLeod. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's Colin or McGregor or something, you know. Yeah. And then there's the uh, spinoff show, Highlander the Raven. Yeah, I that's... I guess that started... 
right yeah i tried to do a backdoor pilot kind of thing with some ladies uh, and uh, none of them panned out so they went with oh yeah we have this other girl who's not the raven and we're gonna try to push this and it it could have been cool cool but at that time people were already over the series yeah yeah if you're burned out on the main series then uh branching off to the uh to the spinoff may not be the best move so if we if we do a timeline of all this, at one point they're making movies, a television show, and an animated series, all of which are not terribly popular or making much money. <laughs> yeah. Who's funding all this? <laughs> That's the crazy things that I've seen. Some of these strange corporations in Europe that funded a lot of this stuff that's why it's in argentina for the second one and that's why the series takes place in vancouver or sea coover and uh paris they shot half a season in each i was blown away by that huh weren't they sh- weren't they also shooting like romania or something so yeah um yeah. let me tell you a little Again, weird thing about the the cartoon series they brought ramirez back except <laughs> It's not the same Ramirez. It's his yes. brother. So, so they wanted that uh, Obi Wan type thing you talked about, which another mm-hmm. Scottish Spaniard from Egypt. Yeah, basically, <laughs> he, he looks the same. They drew him on a model of Sean Connery. Who, happy birthday! You know, if we're oh, recording yeah. this happy on that birthday, day, Sean. Um, it's it's weird because it's a kids show. They did a non-lethal hmm. form of the quickening. Weird. <laughs> Weird. So nobody nobody cuts it each well, other's heads off. There, there's. I didn't make it that far. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> you knew people were dying, and there was like something similar to what happens with, with Connor McCloud's last appearance in the movies. It happens here. There's like a collective of of people that are hiding to. Make sure nobody can get the prize. But the fake Ramirez, just, I like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then there is still Highlander in game, which is not oh, the end game. Yeah. Uh, Immortals Connor and Duncan McLeod must join forces against Kel, and an evil immortal has become too strong for anyone to face. That's in 2000. Then uh, we still get the Highlander, the source, <laughs> in oh, 2007. God. And in 2007, there's an animated film, Highlander, The Search for Vengeance. Did you get through any of these? I made it through all three. Oh. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> MVP. Take me back. <laughs> so we have an end game. End game was a great way to wrap up the series and the films and bring them back together into one thing. But It could have been really good, <laughs> but it was like... And we then, use the same group that that's shot the, start the show. Of every Highlander description. <laughs> <laughs> it Sorry, could have been. Ooh, it really could good. have been. Uh, I wanted to cut my head off after watching it. No, um, it, it did great flashback stuff because that's kind of the bread and butter. We're going to show you how mm-hmm. we've moved through time. The antagonist is a priest that Connor accidentally kills one of his people. He's around the mcleods but not a mcleod so we're starting this all these immortals are like in the same village <laughs> growing up yeah, and then why, why does well, everybody have to be a mcleod well just so to we keep, can keep the highlander. It a highlander we should have called it immortal or the immortals or you know i don't want to get in trouble with <laughs> whoever owns that pri- <laughs> that property um these these are the, the sandra bullocks of scotland <laughs> <laughs> It's just in every freaking movie. <laughs> but but Endgame did a great thing to wrap it all up, but they didn't close it out. Hmm. I'm going to jump ahead to the source so we can move on with our lives. Um, hmm. The source, I was really excited because uh, I didn't know it was out there. And I saw it probably a year after it came out, and I rewatched it for this. Actually, I fell asleep the first time. <laughs> That's um, on brand. Yeah, <laughs> this is so bad. Oh. It's almost moving back to part two. It's so otherworldly, and the special effects are so bad. So bad. So they did they the end keep... game, and they're like, 
Oh, this is it. All right, we're going to finish it up. Wait a minute. That's, this one that's made what the like was. $7. The next one, though. The next The one. next one. <laughs> There's a... Yeah. It's more mythical stuff, like, okay. creeping me out. Anyway, there's one guy, he actually sings the so- the Queen songs as he's hunting Duncan MacLeod. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, I, I skipped this. I jumped over it. Connor was killed in Endgame by Duncan, so oh. Duncan could have his powers. Um, Spoiler. It yeah. kind of sucked God. that you lose. I might have gotten there in three years. Yeah. Sorry, spoilers. Um, I feel like after the first one, it shouldn't have happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I made it through. The The actual cherry on the cake is the animated anime. It's you. Uh, which one of you recently watched the Matrix series? Right, Animatrix. Oh, okay, I've seen so, it. Like so one it. of the guys was part of the Animatrix that, that took care of this, and it's, huh. it's worth a watch. It's... It's anime, so you know what you're getting into right away. But they've gone so far off into the future that there's so much missing in between how we got from today to the desolate, horrible things in the planet. Um, but it was worth a watch. It's cool. Well, stylized in the next four violence. films will get plenty of flashbacks yeah. that'll fill in and those who, holes. Who who's the McLeod in this one? So this is another McLeod, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I found this out. Duncan was not a true McLeod, but he was kind of adopted. So, same thing with this guy, except he, he predates Oliver McLeod's. He's the one I was kind of mentioning. Uh, the Romans had come into Scotland and uh, were taking care of business. Jeez. Tore up his life. So really, adopted. <laughs> if if Connor had just slaughtered everyone in his own clan, he could have got the prize like hundreds of years before. <laughs> well, hindsight. That's what they would. That that's what a, a sane person would read out of this. But uh, no, they're adopted people, and Duncan somehow was a Native American for a little while. He might have been in Father's Creed in the sure, background somewhere. Not? Yeah, right. So I feel violated. It, in the source, do we find that the source of all their immortal power is somewhere in Scotland? Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the farm McLeod. It's like some uh, kind of. It's, planetary alignment thing oh, that God. has okay. almost happened before and that's what caused all these supernatural beings to run around and protect the source it reminded me of uh, some of the blade uh mm. trinity storylines like weird stuff that had nothing to do with the first two movies <laughs> right like very large but at least immortal people fun. well yeah <laughs> Ryan yeah, Reynolds, I, he showed I, up. I actually, when I was rewatching um, one and two, I, I guess I had never really thought about it before. But I really enjoy sword fighting movies, and yeah. um, I, and and I was gonna say we don't get them very often, but if you look them up, like there is every couple years uh, an actual new movie comes out where there's enough featured sword play. And uh, yeah, it is a lot of fun. And I think that's where the big thing that I was paying attention to was how different it's treated in these older ones versus yeah. the, the new ones. Like uh, nobody's spinning a hundred times in place and connecting, you know, <laughs> how somehow they have eight swords or something, you know, all at once. It's just one dude with a big heavy sword and yeah. he's, uh, he's trying to, you know, connect at all anywhere on somebody else's body. Yeah, you um, look at who was... Doing their sword training, and it goes back to all the movies we loved with swords. I don't know if that's a trivia thing. So, is it the same guy? <laughs> yeah, you were this guy from oh, Star okay. Wars. Oh, okay. So, so the same guy who did the battle coordination for S- Star Wars lightsaber battles did yeah. Highlander stuff. Oh, I want to say Giller. I... Well, that kind of makes sense now that I'm thinking about some of those. Battles. The Star Wars ones are a bit more polished, but there's some elements where sure, yeah, they use money. stuff around them or they're retreating or whatever. Hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm exhausted. Watch, watch the anime. It's good. <laughs> We've been recording for seven hours now about. <laughs> All right. So there are tons of different angles on God. these Highlander 
this Highlander franchise. Uh, and at this point, it's a pretty much choose your own adventure sort of thing. You know, yep. you decide what the Highlander is to you um, and run away with it. And uh, there is going to be um, a, a retake coming up uh, to reboot the series. And I think we're all probably on board with that idea Yes, because there's if, no Christopher Lambert. If ever there was a franchise sure? that was in dire Actually, need sure. of a reboot, it's Highlander. <laughs> Start over fresh. You, you think you wouldn't, after so many efforts, <laughs> you would think you'd be like, you know what, let's just never, ever touch this again. But They've been doing uh, yeah. brand marketing for 30 years, trying to get the name Highlander popular, and they've done that. They just now need something to back it up. Yeah. But before we get to the retake that's coming up, we have our own pitches that we've written. <laughs> For our own Highlander, Immortal, whatever. I, I don't know. I, I don't know where you guys took it on uh, what you're doing, but I don't know if anybody's an alien or not. But uh, <laughs> I think we'll have some different takes. Uh, let's see. Let's hear from Corey first. He's, oh, our, wow. he's our guest. He should, he should leave. Thank you. Pitches. Well, I want to say before I start, I love this part of your podcast so much that I'm really nervous right now. <laughs> You got this, bro. Thank you. So, do you want me to go down like you guys yeah, have you, listed on? Okay. If you've, if you've got a name, uh, casting yeah. <laughs> director, that sort of thing. Yeah. Again, do it. Uh, do I did it. a late night college cram. So, if it doesn't make any sense, please forgive me. Okay, it will so, also be on brand. Yeah. And, and better <laughs> than they ever did. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Uh, I'm going to go for a trilogy. I want to see a trilogy like we did when we were kids. Um, I, I'm definitely upset that we we only got the one <laughs> that made any sense, if if at all. <laughs> I'll tell you the titles in a second. I'm going to I'm add a producer because I feel like I wanted this guy as a as a director, but I, in my my pretend Hollywood, he's a little busy. So I got Ridley Scott as a producer. Hmm. And uh, I've got uh, Christopher McQuarrie as a director. You scared me for a minute. I know, I know. That's why I did it. <laughs> no uh, I, no I'm ever. a big fan of the podcast, so I, I'm i listening to you guys. <laughs> um, but if, if you guys don't know him, he does pretty much everything with Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I did not. So I've got Ewan McGreg McGregor as Connor. Okay. I'm going to do some weird stuff here. I've got uh, Naveen Andrews as the Kurgan. I've got David Oyelo O as Ramirez. He's uh, from Selma. He played uh, Martin Luther King. He was on Star Wars Rebels, oh. voice actor, as uh, yes. a guy named Agent Callus, which blows people away because he's so good. And he is not what the character looks like. So it's pretty cool. Um I dug back a little bit, and I because I was disappointed that they used him so poorly, I want to bring back Donnie Yen, and I'm not going to tell you his character's name because it, it would ruin something later. Um, thank you for letting me go first so I could get this joke in. Sandra Bullock is going to be in this. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I wanted to add Kevin McKidd. I had a hard time deciding if I wanted him to be Connor. So I just wrote Duncan in just to just to have these two guys because I I loved him in Train Spotting, and uh, I mean I don't think they've been anything else together since I don't know. Wow! But uh, here we go. So the first one is the Highlander. I'm going to call it the Highland. Actually, Highlander. We're not going to put a V on there. We don't do that. <laughs> okay. For thousands of years, the Immortals have moved through time, affecting the course of history. Some of them have used their long lives to help mankind overcome, and some of them have used their gifts to enslave. Always moving through time, these warriors have had one goal, the prize. There can be only one. In a valley surrounded by mountains on all sides, two armies march into formation with banners uniting and dividing the growing masses. Horses and riders appear on the cliffs above and are watching one lone warrior make his way onto the battlefield. He is alone and carries a single sword. 
he moves effortl- effortl- <laughs> effortlessly <laughs> there it is. Just through the two word. armies to find his target. He quickly comes upon him and with a swift slice has removed his head and lightning begins to strike the battlefield, causing the armies to disperse. The passage of time moves forward and similar battles begin and end in the same way, always a severed head and lightning, but with many different men and women holding the swords. In the distance of every battle, four horsemen, unfazed by the supernatural, ride on as the lightning intensifies. In 1536, Connor MacLeod rides to battle with his kinsmen and leaves behind any chance at a normal life. He is quickly stabbed through the chest moments after the battle begins by the sword of a mysteriously dark warrior on a ghostly horse. The bronze warrior is kept from taking MacLeod's head by the warring clansmen. After the battle clears and the wounded are attended to, in the distance, the horsemen gather and in agreement declare that they have found the Chosen One. Gasping for air in a pile of varied, kilt-wearing bodies, MacLeod emerges and stumbles to find his kin. Having quickly been branded in league with the devil, MacLeod flees into the cold Scottish countryside alone, but somehow alive. A rider out of place at this battlefield finds MacLeod and begins to educate him on his unholy gift. He introduces himself as Juan Sanchez Villalobos Ramirez, currently of Spain and previously in the service of Egypt. He explains his age, almost 3,000 years old, and the rules of the immortals. After some convincing, MacLeod accepts his new life as the student of the stranger to the Scottish Highlands. Ramirez traces his life out for MacLeod in vivid flashbacks to illustrate the choices that made him and the many lives he has lived. More and more secrets of the immortals... Sorry emerge as the years go by and McLeod and Ramirez continue moving on through time. Love comes and goes, friends die, and new immortals are found and trained by the pair. Ramirez continues to share more of the origins of the immortals and his role in their history. He is preparing to share his final secrets minutes before his head is taken by the man called the Kurgan. He is the bronze warrior who triggered McLeod's immortality almost a century before. So that's the first one. We're going to move on to the second. Highlander, The Gathering. i Wonder where I got that title. <laughs> <laughs> Dismayed and lost in grief, MacLeod, after an absence from Scotland for 86 years, returns to his ancestral homeland and finds a new clan of MacLeods star- starting down the same path. He finds Duncan, waking after death in battle, and begins to teach him in the ways of the immortals. Desperate to understand the ongoing fight of the immortals and find meaning, the two drift in and out of each other's lives. The two remaining horsemen begin to appear, one on a reddish-brown horse and the other on a white horse, at different battles and observe the outcomes as the march of time continues. Never flinching in their observations of battles, of men or the single combat between immortals, they wait at the ready for what must come. The pieces begin to fit together as the centuries move on and more immortals become known to the men of the Clan MacLeod. Separate in the, ser- in the search for the truth about their kind, the MacLeods uncover the threads of immortals throughout recorded history. Exploring the historical records of many many countries and religious organizations, they then they learn that every major unexplainable event in history was the result of the quickening pouring forth as a poor soul lost their immortality. These gatherings coincided with the moments that tipped the scales in the balance of good and evil. In their search, and with the help of sympathetic immortals, various wars are remembered and crucial moments are realized as being under the influence of immortal actions. From the Trojan War to the War of the Roses, other immortals filled in the hidden history of the MacLeods. Their memories reveal knowledge forgotten through, throughout the last several hundred years. As the years turn to decades, the truth of the prize begins to come clear. Become clear. The winner will have control over the entire world. War and darkness, or peace and prosperity. And then six months later, we're going to release Highlander the Prize. <laughs> At the last battle for the fate of the world, Connor finds the answer to the last of Ramirez's secrets. Ramirez, so long as he's kept his head, was a guardian. He was the rider who, so very long ago, adverted the plague of famine from destroying the world. The other riders continue to hold war and pestilence at bay as they wait for the Chosen One to claim the prize and destroy death. These immortals were a safeguard against the evil that had longed to take the prize and plunge the world into darkness. The time of the last gathering is at hand, and Connor MacLeod must face his old enemy. The Kurgan has been on a seemingly unending mission to kill as many immortals as he can, always looking for the Chosen One who will bring him his prize. The Kurgan, from the beginning of time, was known as Cain. Following years of peace and prosperity, he grew jealous of his brother and took his life. His full punishment did not come immediately. It took thousands of lifetimes. Having had a family before his brother's murder, he watched his family die off one by one. Their descendants spread across the earth, and ever so often, out of his lineage, came immortals 
who only wanted power and destruction. His brother's heirs longed for peace and reluctantly were drawn into the conflicts unleashed by their uncle's jealousy. He was exiled and began his life as a marked man. He had an unleashed unnatural death. He had unleashed unnatural death and was now forced to keep unleashing it upon the earth for the rest of all time. Unable to continue a family of his own, unable to have what he stole from his brother. After years of hiding his true goal, he admits to Connor that the killing of the other immortals was only to find the chosen one who could release him from his sentence. He wants to be free of life and free of those who he deemed too weak to live. The oldest immortals, who are the last of the horsemen, gather to either realize or to hold off the plagues of man. Sworn to this duty from the moment of their rebirth as immortals, these ancient ones hope they can move on like their old friend Ramirez and finally know peace. Connor takes Cain's head and the prize is released, freeing himself, Duncan, and the rest of the immortals of their curse, for there can only be one. The whole trilogy. Wow. You really thought through that. Um, I haven't slept in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and That's uh, impressive. Same cast and director for all of them, right? Yeah. They're going to okay. add a few people, but uh, Sandy was one of the, the four horsemen. <laughs> Sandy. And... Uh, <laughs> I just thought I just thought she'd be great. She was originally cast as yeah. Connor, but uh, something, came, something up. came up, and she had to take a different. Donnie Yen, though, I thought he just he was in Endgame for like two minutes, <laughs> and you're like, this is this guy's amazing, and you used him so poorly. So I thought, hey, let's bring him back, and he'll be guarding Earth from these so-called biblical plagues. <laughs> I like it. Right. You, you adhered to a lot of the original content, but then fixed it. I wanted to go deeper. Yeah, where well, we got some, we actually got some wrap up that made sense. Very cool. Uh, I like your choice of cast, and uh, I like uh, McCory too. I think mm-hmm. he's uh, he's a good action director, so I think he'll be. Uh, I think he'll be good for those. <laughs> he's he's got a Sandy mo- movie coming out. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> is Tom Cruise in it too? Um, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I kind of like the idea of, because there is sort of a, or there could be, I guess, if you if you did the right treatment here, sort of a Lord of the Rings, you know, overarching story, like, rather than trying to mm-hmm. um, tell one story beginning to end, like, uh, as far as in one film, uh, or leave it open-ended to, you know, this could be like a Batman sort of thing where anybody comes in and tells their own story of, you know, using the same character, which is kind of what they've done. Um, then yeah. you have, I'm going to tell a big story, but I'm going to give it enough time to breathe. And I think that could work really well. That's yeah. I think it's what good I was idea. hoping for. Assuming the first one is strong enough to get audiences coming back. <laughs> Otherwise you're only going to get Whatever. the one and then forever. Nobody like, cared in making the rest of these. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, yeah. I was going to film them all at once. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's no good. going back now. You got to commit. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so I am trying to do. I am keeping like uh, some characters, uh, name wise at least. Um, but I'm one of the things I want to do is get away from calling it Highlander, um, because then we're trapped into this whole McLeod thing where everybody has to be a McLeod. I just want it to be about the Immortals or whatever. So um, I'm calling this Eternal Blades, just because it sounds really cool. And um, cool. I'm using one of our uh, audience members' suggestions from the live podcast. They suggested Gerard Butler. Uh, and I kind of like that. So I'm going to use use him for Connor. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Wynnum uh, as uh, Duncan. He was in uh, 300 with uh, Butler. Um, uh, very cool mm-hmm. dude. Got a cool way about him, and um, so I, I'm calling him Duncan. Uh, Halle Berry is in here as the Spaniard. I wanted to change her up as sort of a a joke because oh. uh, you know oh. uh, he's not really a, a Spaniard at all, <laughs> and so I just wanted to make it another non obvious Spaniard. Um, but everybody calls her Spaniard, uh, and I like her, and I think it'd be really nice to have. Uh, what's one of the things they did, like that ending? What's the one where um. Or the Raven is more of a highlight of the one of the female cast members. So I kind of like having somebody stronger uh, in a female role in the Islander um, or the immortal sort of treatment. And then uh, Liam Neeson is actually going to be in here as Kurgan. So I am keeping names. So director-wise, uh, I'm choosing Michael Mann, 
Um, I really like a lot of the stuff mm. he directs. I think he's a good action director. Not everything he does turns out 100%, but uh, I'm a big fan of when it does. It's uh, it's really, really good. And I think it'd be a lot of fun to see uh, to see him take this on. He did uh, um, uh, Last of the Mohicans, which uh, has some good fight sequence in there, which I think would uh, translate well to swordplay as well. Um, so a bit of a caveat here or a lead up or an intro or whatever, almost every iteration of Highlander somehow contradicts or ignores its predecessor. So I think it's sort of futile pretending there's a specific canon for this franchise. I think, uh, there's what we want or wish there was, but everybody's sort of broken off. So I am choosing to do a full reboot, uh, but keeping some of the concepts. So swordplay, I really like that immortals and the game but the game itself and its rules have been rewritten so that's kind of different as well all right so here we go here's sort of the uh the um lead-in card that you'd you'd read uh before the before the movie begins long before the celestial wars the gods had placed hundreds of caretakers on each of the blessed planets these immortal demigods carried out the celestial ruler's will maintaining a planet's order and balance but when the gods died the immortals were lost their destiny became their own their purpose and duty left for them to decide their power was theirs to use how they pleased we open on a sword fight on a grassy hill, two opponents giving their all to best the other, but neither can connect. These men are dressed in ancient Scottish attire, their sword and shields of 17th century craftsmanship. They deflect blow after blow until one is struck in the forearm, losing his sword along with his arm. Down on the ground he surrenders, and the winning Highlander agrees to let him live. A crowd cheers, and we see this was a demonstration. Families in modern clothes, all filming with their phones, applaud, stuff donations into a box, and quickly move on to the gift shop. The winner of the battle stands over the defeated Highlander. No applause for the champion, asks the victor, as our hero, Connor McLeod, picks his severed arm off the ground. I wish you'd stop doing that, Duncan says, Connor. And we watch him piece himself back together. The friends cut to a pub where they tell stories of old empires and old love, sing ancient songs, dance outdated dances, then stumble home, stumble to their respective homes. Connor falls into bed, but Duncan is met by a shadowy figure waiting for him in the dark. The man asks him to raise his sword, and then the Highlander brings up his weapon from the earlier fight. The shadowy figure says, no, your true sword. Duncan and the man cross weapons, each clash sending lightning to the skies. Duncan's home crumbles under the destructive force, and the combatants spill into the nearby fields. The skies blacken, and a storm builds around them, shrouding the men from watchful eyes. Trees explode, and the earth cracks with every parry and thrust. When Duncan is defeated, he asks for mercy. The villain says, This is your mercy, and he cuts off Duncan's head. Connor is awoken the next day as someone breaks into his home. He reaches for his sword, only to have it kicked away. Luckily, it's someone Connor knows. She calls herself Spaniard. The Spaniard tells Connor that his fellow clansman has been murdered by Kurgan and that they need to run. They flee to Africa to summon the council in a place where the immortals formerly communed with the gods. Here we are introduced to other demigods, and we get some explanation of who these people are and what they're doing on Earth. Some are still trying to help humanity, others running corporations or criminal organizations. None of them respect Connor, who, like Duncan, had decided to shrink away from their godlike powers and live as normal people. They talk about Kurgan and how he believes that by killing all the demigods, he will be transformed into a full god, which would give him absolute power over the planet. No one knows what he wants to do with the power, and many believe the theory is unfounded. We're all that's left of the gods, they say. There will never be another one. The council is divided on what to do with Kurgan, but some agree he needs to be dealt with. With their... When they form their team, Connor wants to join and avenge the death of Duncan, but only the Spaniard agrees to let the Highlander in. She says he needs to embrace his full power, and we get a sweet montage of training in both swordplay and paranormal powers. <laughs> we also learn that each sword was given to them directly by the gods, each sword containing a piece of his or her power. As Connor is trained, the montage shows Kurgan fighting finding and slaying other immortals. He takes a piece of each demigod's sword and reforges it into his own, enhancing his abilities each time. Ooh. We also learn that his motivation to become a full god is to res resurrect his family who died centuries before. 
Also sprinkled throughout the movie is Connor's own past and dealing with repeated loss and what led him to hide away from his powers. When the Spaniard thinks Connor is ready, the group finds Kurgan but fails to defeat him. Most of them die, but Connor is able to disarm him and Kurgan retreats, leaving his sword behind. Connor is alone but imbued with new abilities. He returns to the council where they see he is more than what he once was, and the factions of the immortal council vie for his side and possibly a new direction for what the council could become. Some think they could come together to finally rule the planet. Others believe they should carry out their original intent, keeping the forces of Earth in balance. What they agree on is that Kurgan must go. The climax shows many immortals band together to defeat Kurgan, and Connor becomes the head of the council. As he takes his head seat, his hefty eternal blade at his side, the voice of a god speaks to the group, Be careful, Highlander, your power is too great. Serve us again, or become our enemy. We are watching. And that's it. It leaves it kind of huh. open-ended. Do whatever nice. you want. But yeah. my definition yeah. is kind of s- simple. They're demigods, and that's it. Like, we don't need yeah, anything else. Yeah. Yeah, I like the twists on the lore. I like the, the build using the parts of other yeah. swords. Yeah, I think that's cool. And folding them into your yeah. own. Then that's it's cool. like a physical sort of thing. But then somebody else can just pick up your sword that you spent all that time and and uh, and kind of take <laughs> take away the power. I, I think that's kind of neat. Well, uh, until today, I never would have known you were such a fan of sword fighting. Now, now I've learned something new about you. Do they allow uh, swords in Canada? Can I send you Uh, one as a Christmas present? No, we all use uh, plastic uh, silverware and stuff. Uh, They're not allowed to have any sharp objects here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I didn't really know either. It wasn't until watching these where I'm like, you know what? I love sword sword fighting movies. Uh, Yeah, because I I remember loving Blade. And then, you know, any of the, like, the... uh, the swashbuckler, like the the first like Pirates of the Caribbean, is kind of fun, and uh, there's tons of other stuff. Yeah, and then yeah. you know, Star Wars is sword fighting. It's uh, it's it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, until you made the connection earlier that the same guy was the choreographer for all the sword fight scenes, I never would have thought of the parallels with uh mm-hmm. with lightsabers. But it makes perfect sense. Well done, as usual. I like your take yes. on it. I want to read it again. Sometimes. Sometimes I zone a little bit while I'm listening, like trying to picture it. I, I'm not a good reader either, uh, but between yeah, the two, it's hard. I, I get like, the whole story. Uh, you kind of have to sit with it a little bit to to envision it. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't doesn't always come across so no, I like so that. easily so quickly. All right, well, we got two very different takes so far, and I am going to uh, pitch my retake now. Uh, mine is. It goes back to what I was saying before. I think there's good bones in this franchise. So I stuck with a lot of what was provided, but put my own twist on some of it. I like the characters that we've been provided, so I kept most of that the same. But I definitely, uh, I I want Christopher Lambert playing all roles. (laughs) No. Christopher Lambert is not getting near the set of when this is filmed at all. Uh, My film is simply called, much like Corey, Highlander. Not the Highlander, just Highlander. One thing I thought this series was really missing, and they tried for like two lines in the movies, was a bit of humor. Hmm. Because it is very, very dry. But I think if someone lives for thousands and thousands of years, there could be some humor, right? So I'm bringing in one of my favorite directors, Taika Waititi, to take his hand at Highlander. Nice. Stars. Uh, I'm going with uh, with something someone said during the live the other night. Uh, One of my favorite TV shows is Outlander. And I love Sam Hugan, the lead in that. This guy is Scottish. He does a great Scottish accent. There might be some confusion between Outlander and Highlander, but I don't care. I love this guy. I want him in my movie, which the real (laughs) funny part about this is in Outlander, he is Jamie Fraser. And in the movies, the warring clan that Kurgan comes from is Clan Fraser. So, again, there could be some confusion. But nice. in this, Sam Hugan uh, will play our lead role of Connor McLeod. Uh, Joe Manganiello will play Kurgan because I pictured Kurgan as this big, mm. beastly figure, this Conan. Uh, and Joe Manganiello is, is one of the closest things to that. Plus, he's a big D&D fan. He's a hardcore nerd, and I've heard a few podcasts with him. He, he researches the hell out of everything he's in. I think he'd be great in this. And then the other uh, casting choices will I will uh, share as we get there. Setting is going to be 2020 to start, and in uh, in honor of the films, there will be some flashbacks, but I'm going to tell a much more linear story. We'll do a couple flashbacks, and that's it. Uh, so very much unlike the original Highlander, the film focuses on our lead, Connor McLeod. 
In this reboot, we tell the story in a more chronological order, which I just said, but I'm going to drive it home again, starting with the origin story of Connor, because origin stories are the best movies. So that's what we're going to go here. The story goes back to Scotland in 1536, where an 18-year-old Connor is seen with his family and friends preparing for war against their longtime rivals, Clan Fraser. Clan Fraser's leader has taken on the services of the Kurgan, Joe Manganiello, an imposing mercenary in black leather armor. The Kurgan tells Murdoch that he wants to kill Connor on the battlefield and that no one else should fight him, just like in the original movie. The battle begins, and Connor, who has never been in battle before, is very scared. He soon finds no one wants to fight him, but eventually the Kurgan finds him and easily defeats Connor by stag stabbing him in the chest, shouting, there can only be one, or there can be only one. Other warriors from Clan McLeod see the Kurgan preparing to decapitate Connor and attack him, forcing him to retreat. Connor is taken back to the village, but is so badly wounded, everyone assumes he's going to die. Connor makes a remarkable recovery and is now back to normal in only a few days. While he is happy to be alive, his friends ostracize him. His own wife says that his recovery is the work of the devil. Most everyone in the clan mirrors that sentiment. Eventually, the townspeople form a mob, tie him to a pole, and take him out to be executed. But he is freed by an elder who convinces the villagers to commute the death sentence in favor of exile. Flash forward to 2020. Connor McLeod, who now goes by Russell Nash, is walking down the streets of New York City. McLeod feels as if he is being stalked and darts into a nearby parking structure to see if someone will follow. He's followed and quickly attacked by another man with a sword. You'll like this one, this part, Matt. Connor pulls out his sword because, of course, he's walking around New York City in 2020 with a sword. He somehow keeps hidden. And the battle begins. The two fight back and forth until Connor eventually wins and decapitates his assailant. A powerful energy release the quickening, takes place, and Connor absorbs all the power and knowledge from the immortal he has just defeated. We immediately understand that this is not the first or the last time that Connor McLeod has been through this process. And that's a total ode to the original film. You had to have the fight in a parking structure. Hmm. We flash back to Connor in the 1500s, separated from his clan and former wife. He is now with a new woman, and they are living happily in the countryside. During his daily routine, he is approached by a man who looks to be a Spaniard who we eventually learn is named Ramirez, played by Oscar Isaac. Because where is Oscar Isaac from? I love the fact that I can't really tell with him, and I think that's <laughs> perfect because he has, a in this story, he has a much varied background, right? And he, and he could be Egyptian. The Spaniard attacks McLeod at first, and they sword fight for a few minutes before Ramirez bows down before McLeod and reveals that he is not there to kill him, but to train him as an ally for the battle to come. Training montages galore. Yes. Show McLeod learning about Highlander and proper sword fighting and tactics. Years pass and the two form a strong bond. Then, as in the original film, the time comes when Kurgan attacks McLeod and Ramirez. Kurgan is a huge, hulking man who, if you missed, was played by Joe Manganiello, who has killed many before and absorbed their power. His strength is too much for just one person and requires the fighting skills of both warriors to hold him off. Eventually, Kurgan strikes down Ramirez and decapitates him. He turns to McLeod to do the same, but before he can complete the task, is run through with a sword by Heather, McLeod's wife. The injury doesn't kill Kurgan, but is enough for McLeod and his wife to escape off into the mountains. That was the last flashback. We're going straight forward from here on out. Back in 2020, we see more of the daily life of McLeod. Inside his apartment, we see the collection of weapons, books, and photos from his many lifetimes. These tell a story of his many victories, cultures, and loves. Being that it's 2020, the sword fight in the garage led to an investigation, and it doesn't take long for some security footage to out-wrestle Nash, a.k.a. McLeod, as the prime suspect in the decapitation. McLeod is quickly arrested and investigated by the police, along with consultant Brenda Wyatt, played by Jessica Chastain. Because, wow. Yes. Jessica Chastain. Mm -hmm. And now we take a turn. That's, I've kept it pretty much like the original film, but here's where we go. Brenda Wyatt and Nash McLeod form a bond during their investigation, and McLeod eventually reveals to her elements of his past. During one such conversation, Brenda flat out says the word Highlander. McLeod and the audience are shocked to hear that Brenda is familiar with the term. As it turns out, a mythology had formed around the Highlander and the Gathering, and she has been researching this for years. She had specifically become an expert in swords and put herself in a position to consult on cases that might lead to meeting one of the fabled warriors. 
Brenda even knew about Kurgan and the others. Nash, a.k.a. or AKA McLeod, with Brenda's help, is cleared of all charges, and the two form a life together. Shortly after, McLeod is reunited with his old friend, how did you say it? Castagier? Played by Chiwetel Ejiofor, because I love Chiwetel Ejiofor, and I think he should be in more stuff, who hasn't seen in a hundred years. Castagier warns McLeod of an impending threat. Kurgan is close, and they recently battled, but Castagier was able to get away. The two decide to meet up again soon. At their next meeting, McLeod arrives to found Castagier and Kurgan already fighting. He immediately dives into the fight, and we get one of those classic 10-minute battles, a la They Live, minus the bubblegum. <laughs> Throughout the fight, there are many close calls, and eventually Castagier finds himself on the ground, with Kurgan standing over him. McLeod has been thrown to the side and is slow getting up. Kurgan is rambling on, drawing out Castagier's death for way too long, when he is attacked from behind by a third warrior, unseen until now emerging from the shadows of the alley. Kurgan's head slides off his enormous body and he falls to the side, revealing Brenda Wyatt, Jessica Chastain's character. Castagier and McLeod are both baffled, along with the audience. After a few seconds, the quickening begins and the force from Kurgan is transferred into Brenda's body, making her an immortal and filling her with the power and knowledge of hundreds of warriors. Brenda passes out and falls to the ground. We fast forward several days and find Brenda hospitalized, with McLeod standing by her bedside. Her eyes slowly open, and a feeling of relief comes over McLeod. Over days, she recovers and is released to return home. McLeod watches over her and helps her around the house as she gets back to her old self. During this time, Brenda reveals that she had always wondered what would happen if a mortal were to decapitate one of those secret warriors. She had followed McLeod that night in hopes of getting her opportunity. She was beginning to feel the power and had memories from lives she had never lived. It was a state of euphoria she had never experienced. Just as the closing credits are about to roll, we get that false sense that all is well. The camera pushes in on Brenda to reveal a familiar, sinister smirk that we had seen from Kurgan during so many scenes earlier in the film. Something evil has taken over Brenda, but we won't get to see more until the sequel to the reboot. Hmm. Roll the credits. Did they? I, I, I meant I, to ask this before. Did they ever tackle the concept of a mortal getting involved in all this and decapitating one of the uh, Highlanders? I'm sure it happened, <laughs> but there's a a dark quickening that they talk about in the series that causes you to like go nuts ah, and hurt I'm people you love. I'm leading into it without knowing it. So cool. Yeah, I, I wanted to put a nice. twist on it, and it kind of talks to your Raven thing too about there being female warriors, and maybe that eventually we see. Uh, a very different kind of sequel that doesn't jack up the mythology. I, I really like that. I like it for a number of reasons. I, I think uh, one yeah. thing you did was having her, Brenda's character, already having knowledge of the immortals and being obsessed with it, and probably that was her motivation to become a cop in the first place, was so that she would happen upon one. That uh -huh. makes so much more sense. And it, it makes sense if they get involved romantically yeah. where she's been obsessed with them anyway. Like, that's great. And then I like the idea of a, uh, a mortal picking up on this, especially if it's Jessica Chastain, because then you could just have the sequel be she's the main character. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, or at least, you know, a huge, huge part of it. And I think that's cool. It introduces a lot of good concepts. I, yeah, that was a good one. I Again, I always thought there were good bones there, but th what they always failed at was that last half, and maybe this last half is is the fix that it needs to to get going forward in the right direction. So, yeah, yeah. and this, you know, what's funny is I really struggled like like we have in the past with so many films, especially like Dune, of like how do you tackle this? This one just flowed. Once I got mm. going, like I could see this, I could picture this whole thing, and it just it just happened fast. Nice. I was done in like thirty minutes, which never That's happens. Great. Usually, I spend hours on this. All right, cool. Well, so we have a, a variety of stuff, and um, uh, we don't know too much about the upcoming retake. Uh, the synopsis we have so far is an immortal Scottish swordsman faces off with other immortal warriors in order to obtain a coveted ability. So pretty much the description of the first one. They're going for after the prize. They just don't call it the prize. Um, this will be directed by, at this point, uh, Chad Stahelski, who we know Ooh. from uh, John Wick. John Wick franchise uh 
who's in it we don't know there's been a lot of proposed people some of them um kit harrington Stephen amell and charlie hunnam um were being considered for connor mcleod i don't know who we're going to get it's very early on this is just in the announced status um but it's um it's been it's been something that seems like it's really important to stahelski um and he said in an interview with entertainment weekly in 2019 highlander is such a massive property luckily the studio lionsgate is really behind me in this i truly believe this is one of those properties that could actually sustain a good universe meaning a tv show or something and to go out there and just haphazardly throw together what we think would be a good uh sword fighting immortal movie i think would be a mistake honestly the people behind this the studio behind this, they're dying for this to go. If anything, I'm the one holding it back and trying to creatively lay out everything. We just don't want to paint ourselves into a corner creatively like what happened with the original. <laughs> so yeah, everybody acknowledges that, unfortunately, um, because they, they book into the story so nicely in the first one, it trapped them. Uh, the, there are some writers associated with this. Ryan J. Condal, who wrote uh, Hercules, Rampage, and the new uh, upcoming Logan's Run which uh, we might have to do a show on that because I'm, I'm interested in, in that. I don't know how far along they are. Uh, Carrie Williamson, who uh, got a good resume. She wrote Alex Cross, What Happened to Monday, which I saw under a different title. It's called Seven Sisters. Um, it was uh, some sci-fi thing I found randomly one night. Uh, two other, uh, and she also is writing on two uh, other of uh, Chad's upcoming projects. We're old buddies, me and Chad. Uh, Sandman Slim <laughs> is one. Of the, <laughs> and the other is called Gangsters of Shanghai, which I believe is actually a TV show. Um, I I like him. Stahelski is uh, attached to this, and the writing seems like there's, the, from their, their past projects, it'll probably be a good fit for this. And yeah, if he's that concerned over making sure they get it right, then I believe him. Well, that Stahelski is the perfect fit for that, honestly. The guy, he used to be Keanu Reeves' stunt double before he did John Wick. So right. he knows that world. He, the fight scenes in John Wick are amazing. Yeah. Like, I love that so much. And he's actually doing, I know he's a producer. I don't know if he's directing any of it, but they're doing the spinoff from the John Wick movies called um, The Continental that is a TV series based on nice. that universe. So he's already got this expertise in crossing over film. Well, he will have the expertise in crossing over film to television. So we could get this universe like what we used to have. And a mythology. Uh, where you've got these uh, independent films and TV shows crossing over and making a, making a whole universe. I, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I feel like he's the perfect person for that. Yeah, could be really good. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, it's still in the announced stage. We just don't, they haven't gotten too far uh, obviously, we'll we'll update our page on the uh, the podcast there when uh, uh, on the website whenever um, there's new information. Let you know through Twitter as well. Uh, but I, I think we're all excited for that. Obviously, we we despite yeah. its missteps, it's still a lovable <laughs> franchise. It's something we uh, we all want to be really good, and I think that might be part of the reason they kept making them is because everybody's like, this should be good. It's gonna be yeah. good, you know. Uh, and yeah. uh, and unfortunately, not all of them were. But the the show was on for quite a while. I know a lot of people love that, uh, and so it may have actually been probably one of the the strongest things to come out of there. The movies didn't do so hot, but the first movie and the and the TV show I think are are probably worth a watch. I think that speaks to the '80s and '90s too. Like if you look at shows like uh, Seinfeld, if that had come on now, would have never made it past the first six episodes. The mm -hmm. first season was horrible. But mm -hmm. back then, you gave things a chance before you immediately canceled if it wasn't an instant success. And that's what they did with Highlander. And wow, to an extreme. But hey, it might pay off in these new iterations and all that wasn't for naught. Okay, well, it's trivia time, guys. Everybody's excited for trivia. Well, We've got a few things from um, some of the different movies. I don't think all of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's get going. Who's up? You want me to kick it off? Yeah, yeah. All right, starting with the first Highlander. The sword sparking while clashing was accomplished by attaching a wire to each sword that led down the arms of the actors to a car battery. 
One was connected to the positive terminal and the other the negative so that when the swords touched, there was an arc. Wow. That's insane. Practical effects. That, that's wow. a whole lot of nope for me. <laughs> what? Why would anybody agree to do that? That's... No kidding, right? It's so dangerous. No, that's... Uh... It's like uh, the extra yeah. money for was, the bees. Yeah. Was Christopher and Candy Lambert Man. blind before filming or after that scene? Uh, yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert got along so well during filming that they called each other by their characters' names even when they were not filming. And it was at Lambert's insistence that Connery and his character return for Highlander 2. Well, yeah. I, money was involved as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All of Sean Connery's scenes had to be filmed in a week. Due to Connery's schedule, he had a bet with the director, Russell, that they would not finish in seven days. But the director won the bet. Connery earned $1 million for his week's then. work. <laughs> one, yeah. million. $1 million. Dollars. That's yeah. like the equivalent of like $15 million now <laughs> for one week's work. That's pretty good. Does it need to be? I'll take a million dollars. I'd for one happily. Week. I'll take a thousand dollars. Exactly. Yeah. I was about yeah. to say it word for word. <laughs> Care. Uh, you're uh, up. Christopher Lambert had just barely learned to speak English when he took this role. The only other English-speaking movie he had been in at that point was Greystoke from 1984, in which he spoke only a few words. I remember that movie. Wasn't he basically Vaguely. Tarzan? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Queen originally intended to record only one song for the movie, but after viewing footage from the movie, they were inspired to write more. The band members each had a favorite scene and composed songs specifically for them. Brian May wrote Who Wants to Live Forever during the cab ride home after seeing the movie, and Roger Taylor used the line It's a Kind of Magic as the basis for the end title song. Just like me right now, the opening voiceover by Sean Connery has an echo effect because it was recorded in the bathroom of your Spanish villa. You're in the bathroom of your Spanish villa? (laughs) I thought that looked familiar. Yeah. See. Uh, Kurt Russell was originally cast as Connor McLeod, but he pulled out of the project at the insistence of his girlfriend, Goldie Hawn. He instead starting starred in Big Trouble in Little China. He wins. Good choice. <laughs> I, maybe Kurt could have done this, but um, eh. I sure like Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, I'd that's rather have gotten 22 Big Trouble Me in Little too. Chinas, I'll tell you that. Yeah. The quickening is a term for when a baby in the womb shows its first sign of life, its first noticeable movement within the womb. So it's actually, huh. it flutters. The view of New York City from McLeod's apartment is actually photos of New York City, blown up and cut into shapes that fit the windows. Yeah, I say, that's pretty I obvious that. now. That <laughs> is. But when it was in like 480p on a big screen, it was it, you couldn't make it out. Right, yeah. <laughs> While filming in the TV. Scottish Highlands, the production's medical team were kept busy in the afternoons. After a liquid lunch, many of the local Scottish extras got a bit too enthusiastic during the clan battles, with many minor injuries resulting. <laughs> liquid lunch. Everybody got cut up. Uh, according <laughs> to the DVD commentary, the climax was originally intended to take place on top of the Statue of Liberty. This was then changed to an amusement park and finally changed to the rooftop of the Silver Cup Studios building. That was like, there were some cool effects to that with the I letters like that falling sequence. Yeah. yeah, I think it's cool. It's a good final battle. They they actually brought that back later on. I knew it looked familiar. <laughs> yeah, just in passing. Moving on, to Highlander two. Michael Ironside recalled his experiences on the movie. Yeah, listen, I hated the script. We all did. <laughs> Me, Sean, Chris, we all were in it for the money on this one. I mean. It, re- it read as if it had been written by a 13-year-old boy, but I'd never played a barbarian swordsman before, and that was my first big evil mastermind type. I figured it was going to do this stupid movie. movie. I might as well have fun and go as far over the top as I possibly yeah. could. Christopher Lambert was so disgusted with the rewritten script that he wanted to drop out of his movie. Contractual obligations forced him to finish it. So sure. nobody was even enjoying... Before Uh or while it was going on. Uh, Christopher Lambert refused to use a fake sword for the fight scenes. In his first scene with it, he cut his finger to the bone and Michael Ironside dislocated his jaw in the dome fight. After these incidents, Lambert agreed to use a plastic sword. Initial plans for a third movie titled Highlander 3, The Reckoning, 
would have detached the story even further from the original. It would have taken place entirely on Zeist and would have involved Connor training a rebel army to overflow the rulers of the planet. However, the post-production editing of this movie, which changed the ending, plus the poor box office performance, nicks the idea. No kidding. Thank okay. After this film bombed at the box office, it was decided that the following movies, Highlander The Final Dimension, Highlander Endgame, and Highlander The Source, would be true and faithful to the original movie, story, and mythology by pretending this movie never happened. A long-running joke amongst Highlander fans states that the official name of the third movie should have been Highlander 3, The Apology. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, was when Mel Brooks was attached. Uh, Director Russell Mulcahy was so frustrated at being locked out of production that he tried to have his credit changed to Alan Smithy. We all know what that means. However, a section of his contract forbade him from publicly attacking this movie before it was released. The producers say that if he had had his credit changed, it would be considered an attack and he would be sued. An alternate ending, the fairy tale ending, was shown in some European theaters. Louise and Connor magically return to Zeist, embrace in front of a field of stars, transform into light streaks, and fly off into space. It's Stardust? actually on the oh, yeah. DVD, and it was awful. I would totally, I would totally yeah. watch that version. All right, moving on to uh, H3. <laughs> During filming in Montreal, two local punk rockers with mohawk hairdos were hired as extras for a scene in which they attempt to rob the newly awakened Kane in a dark alley. The two were paid a nominal fee and thanked for their services before shooting. The scene was cut after they were seen taking drugs on the set and overheard plotting to kidnap Mario Van Peebles by driving away in the makeup (laughs) RV with him in it. Oh my god. At least they got paid. Can't make that up. Uh, that's great. The original <laughs> script for the film was radically different from the finished product in that the flashback sequences to place in early 17th century Scotland and early 18th century England. MacLeod had an immortal friend in the script named Cavanaugh who had similar aspects like Ramirez. The main villain in the script was named Kilvera. The script started depicting what happened with Connor after he buried Heather, as well as a scene that revealed that he kills Jack the Ripper, who was an immortal as well. Director Andy Morahan had directed several music videos for the band Guns N' Roses and wanted them to do a soundtrack for this film, similar to how Queen did the music in the original film. According to Morahan, they had a, they were excited about the idea, but it fell through when Axl Rose refused to do it if Mario Van Peebles was, remained in the film. The reason for Axl's dislike of Peebles oh God, has never random. been explained. <laughs> All right, and on to Highlander 4. The film's trailer contained many sequences and elements not in the film, including scenes suggesting that the villain, Jacob Kell, possessed supernatural abilities, and a scene showing Connor and Duncan leaping through a magical portal. It was later revealed that certain scenes were shot exclusively for the trailer to make the film look more interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. We're still doing that today. Uh, The film was intended as a bridge between Highlander and Highlander the Raven. Uh, the television shows. The TV series was canceled and cast availability problems caused production delays. Dimension Films soon realized that their plans for the film were not going to meet expectations and scaled back on its release. Kind of a downer ending for the trivia and Highlander as a whole. But that seems appropriate. I was going to say, it's pretty perfect. We're going towards something good. Ah, never mind. (laughs) Highlander, it could have been good. Ah, yeah. So That's the eighth film well we had fun talking about all the highlanders uh i uh i really appreciate you coming on Corey. it's uh it's great talking with you about this especially movies and and stuff that you know we had watched when we were younger and um you know we we we'd seen it a lot we talked about it then we're talking about it now and that's pretty cool uh decades later we're still yep. talking about highlander so i guess oh. we enjoyed it somewhat <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll have to have Corey back on for a follow-up whenever this uh, retake comes yeah. out and uh, do a review of that. That would be fun. Yeah. Uh, be sure to follow us on uh, Twitter. Subscribe to us. Give us some of those reviews, too, those delicious, delicious reviews. And uh, check out the website. Uh, there's always great stuff on uh, over there. The podcast is available through the website, movieretakes.com, as well as our articles and our pitches as well. 
Thank you, everybody, for coming out for another quality movie retakes podcast. Nerds unite! Now go and remember, there can be only one. Oh, no.